This episode of Culture Crash is sponsored by Skillshare. Hey guys, Culture here. Today we're going to discuss fairy tales. More specifically, we'll look at who wrote the fairy tales we know so well, and why they're so popular. My favorite fairy tale is the one about a boy and a girl, each with magical powers, who help a lonely boy to escape his own dream world. I don't think I've heard that one before. What's it called? I can't remember, but the girl has lava powers and the boy's part shark. Crash, Shark Boy and Lava Girl isn't a fairy tale. It is to me, damn it! No, 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 no. A fairy tale is something like Cinderella or Little Red Riding Hood. Thing is, it's kind of hard to define exactly what a fairy tale is. You could say that a fairy tale is a short story with magical elements, but that's not totally accurate. According to that definition, something like Goosebumps could be considered a collection of fairy tales. On the other hand, it also excludes some longer works that are famously considered to be fairy tales, like The Wizard of Oz, Alice in Wonderland, and Pinocchio. So, in conclusion, Sharkborn and Lava Girl is a fairy tale. See you all next week! It's hard to pin down the exact meaning of a fairy tale, it's more like you know it when you see it. And that's largely due to how prolific these stories are. Stories like Sleeping Beauty, Snow White and Rapunzel have been translated into many languages, had whole plot elements scrapped or rearranged to change the meaning of the story. Do a quick Google of your favourite fairy tale and you'll find a few videos about the original version of the story, probably with some macabre twist to hook you in. Or maybe there's a Chinese version of a famous German fairy tale, or a Russian version of a fairy tale from Greece. The point is, people love telling these stories, but if they're known worldwide, who actually wrote them? Maybe they were implanted in our brains by aliens. You know, the same ones that built the pyramids. It could be, or it could be another answer that isn't completely stupid. The first pair that people point to is the Brothers Grimm, brothers from Germany who put together a series of fairy tales in a book called Grimm's Fairy Tales. Now, of course, the Brothers Grimm never actually claimed to have written all of these fairy tales. Instead, they travelled through Germany and collected numerous folk tales in the interest of preserving a national storytelling identity. They then edited the story slightly to conflate the differing versions they heard in their travels, attached some kind of message to the stories, and compiled them into one volume. You probably hear a lot about how grim the fairy tales are by people who think they're hilarious, but that's actually not quite right. Sure, the first edition of their stories were dark compared to your Disney adaptations, but these were simply the original versions of the stories. In fact, after their first edition was so popular, it was the Grimm's themselves who released a second edition with more child-friendly fairy tales. So the Grimm's weren't that grim after all. It's a fabricated coincidence. Just like when you were at the skating rink on a date and I just so happened to be there the same day. Wait, you did that on purpose? The chance meeting was a sham, but the happiness we felt that day was real. You knocked my date to the ice and laughed as the security skated after you. Exactly! I was laughing! It was fantastic! Unbelievable. The Brothers Grimm weren't the first people to get the idea of compiling folk tales, though. About a century before the Grimms got to them, a Frenchman called Charles Perrault first had the idea of taking half-forgotten folktales and spinning them into fairy tales. You probably know Perrault better by his fictional storytelling persona, Mother Goose. Perrault provided some of the first literary forms of these fairy tales, often credited as creating the genre with stories like Little Red Riding Hood, The Sleeping Beauty, Puss in Boots, and Bluebeard, inside his book, Tales of Mother Goose. So the Grimms just stole his stuff. Did they even give him credit? I hate people who steal other people's stuff without giving them credit. Mm. All sources for this video are in the description below. Not really. I have alluded to it, but most of these folktales have no clear author. They were stories passed down through the oral tradition of storytelling, from both the poor and the nobles alike. By analysing common occurrences of the stories in different cultures and tracing back their common linguistic ancestors, researchers found that some of these stories are even thousands of years old. Beauty and the Beast and Rumpelstiltskin are about 4,000 years old, while Jack and the Beanstalk is roughly 5,000 years old. Beauty and the Beast is 4,000 years old? Damn, Emma Watson is looking real good for her age. I know you're kidding, at least I hope you are, but I should emphasize here that the old versions of these stories would be significantly different from the versions we know now. Each society has reworked these ancient fairy tales for their own purposes. During the mid-17th century in France, aristocratic women would gather at one another's houses and discuss various such folk tales at length as a parlour game, inviting one another to put their own twist on the story. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the twists on these stories would often carry some political or social message pertinent to the women's lives. For example, in Little Red Riding Hood, one of the more common versions has the wolf eating the grandmother and then wearing her clothes. Little Red Riding Hood is then lured closer and closer to the wolf before he reveals his true identity and gobbles her up. In this version, the wolf is an analogy for smooth-talking aristocratic men who would charm women closer to them before revealing their true violent nature. 
abusing the women. You can see how a multitude of fairy tales could be twisted so that women could slyly comment on the injustices of their day. Awesome! So you could be telling Jack and the Beanstalk, but then when Jack meets the giant, instead of being chased, the giant is all like, Let me tell you why women should be allowed to vote. That'd be a little on the nose, but yeah. Essentially, everyone enjoyed playing upon the expectations of fairy tales that they all knew, but creating an entirely new meaning out of it. Fairy tales were a shared moment of creativity. Of course, nowadays we have other ways of stretching our creative muscles, and you can learn all about them over at Skillshare, our sponsor for this episode. Sheesh, talk about on the nose. Skillshare is an online learning community built for creative people to explore their interests. You know, try stuff out that you think, hey, that looks neat, how do I do that? Or maybe it's something you do professionally and you want to hone your skills. That includes stuff like animation, filmmaking, or my personal passion, writing. Ooh, they even do web development. My vintage Flash game site will be up and running in no time. I'm gonna make billions off of Mother Load and Toss the Turtle. They also do business analytics. You might want to look into that crash. I recently took a class called Creative Writing Bootcamp, start a brand new story, taught by Myla Goldberg. Myla has some great tips for how to get out of your own shoes and into someone else's. Plus, the class came with exercises to actually learn the skill. By the end, I was able to imagine I was someone whose thought processes were completely alien to me. You'll never really be able to know what I'm thinking. Oh, but I do know what you're thinking, Crash. You're thinking a premium service like this must come with a hefty price tag. You'd be wrong. An annual subscription costs just $10 a month, giving you access to a smorgasbord of creative insight and professional wisdom. $10! I was actually thinking how rad pencils are, but that's pretty incredible too. I can finally meet other people who support me in creative endeavors. Just you wait, culture. I'll be rolling in Flash Game Dough in no time! Shoot for the stars, buddy. The first thousand of you you guys at home to click on the link in the description below will get a two month free trial of premium membership so you can check out what all this creative goodness is about. Make it 999, I just joined. Perfect. One thing I've learned about creativity is just how much of it comes from what people have already created. So much of the popular culture we have now has its roots in fairy tales, repeating the same motifs that our ancestors used thousands of years ago. Talking animals, magical weapons and keys, monsters like gnomes and trolls. Much of the fantasy genre stems from fairy tales, like the original fantasy novels The Princess and the Goblin and Fantasties by George MacDonald. Of course, this also includes The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. Both fantasy and fairy tales share many of the same tropes. It's just that fantasy is usually longer or more epic in scale. Cool! So if you want to write a hugely popular book series, I just need to rip off a fairy tale. Got it! Some motifs are highly specific to fairy tales, however, and it's these tropes that usually make us think, this story is a fairy tale. Stuff like wicked stepmothers, clever word games, magic chants, a contrast between royalty and peasants, and, of course, damsels in distress. By far the most prevalent image is that of the forest. Forests are featured in every one of the Grimm's fairy tales, and for good reason. Forests were the outskirts of human settlements. They were a mysterious place in which monsters might reside, or where odd people had made their home. Therefore, they made the perfect setting for strange encounters and fantastical tales. And so, the valiant logging companies cut down all the mysterious woods, banishing the evil monsters from our world forever. Truly, they are the heroes of our time. Jokes aside, morality was another big part of fairy tales. Nowadays we have anti-heroes and ambivalent characters, but fairy tales were always pretty straight to the point, with clear good and evil characters. Three little pigs good, wolf evil. Seven young kids good, wolf evil. Little Red Riding, okay yeah, you get the idea. Evil witches, stepmothers, trolls and giants all prey on typically poor, hapless folk, each representing some evil facet of human nature. Almost always in the traditional versions of these stories, good would triumph over evil. And that good-evil dichotomy was essential, since most of these stories had clear messages that were only strengthened through example. Pinocchio teaches us not to lie. The Frog Princess teaches us to give people a chance despite their first impression. Rumpelstiltskin warns us about the dangers of greed and the importance of accepting responsibility for your actions. And Little Red Riding Hood taught us the importance of getting your eyesight checked. I mean, seriously, how does a wolf look anything like Grandma? Apart from the whiskers, I suppose. Well, I should mention that many of these stories have a variety of different interpretations, especially since there are so many versions of the fairy tales to begin with. It's kind of mind-boggling. There's something about the simplicity of their basic format that really appeals to us, that gets ingrained in our consciousness. I can say Goldilocks and the Three Bears, and the whole story is instantly called to your mind. The simplicity is perfect for teaching morals to children, 
like in Goldilocks, how we see that our actions hurt others unintentionally. But make no mistake, fairy tales were never just for children. I can think of a couple adults that could afford to learn some lessons from fairy tales. I'm a child at heart. Whether you believe in the power of fairy tales to teach good morals or not, there is another giant reason to know your fairy tales. Everyone else does. Now don't put on your hipster hat just yet. Just because everyone else knows them, that's not a bad thing. Having common points of reference with other people allows us to bond. I'm sure you have a friend you bond with because you quote movies to each other, or you both love stand-up comedy or games or whatever it may be. Fairy tales are like that, but a thousand times more useful because people all over the world know what you're talking about when you reference Pinocchio or Cinderella. And that's because everyone's ancestors played a part in shaping the fairy tales we know today, from every class and every country. Ah, what a beautiful note to leave everyone on. I guess you could say that this is a fairy tale ending, huh? <laughs> Oh god, that was terrifying. See you all soon.